Hi, and welcome to everyone's favourite segment, Mailbag Monday, where I open my mail. Ta-da! Every Monday is like Christmas time. I've got six items here today. Let's crack them open and see what I've got. This is the segment where you can send in stuff, and I open it on air, and, well, I just rant about it, I guess. Is that the segment? I think so. Let's get to it. And first cab off the rank here, I've had this one for quite some time now, it's from R. Larrabee. Thanks, R. Larrabee from Littleton, MA, which I assume is Massachusetts, in the United States of America. Sorry, everyone complains about my ridiculous American accent, which I can't do. Anyway, let's have a look in here. Let's see what R. Larrabee, wonder what R stands for. We have a letter. Let's have a look. Dear Mr. Jones, how polite. I currently work in facilities management and have been watching your videos for over a year now. I want to thank you for helping me get started in setting up my shop. I'm sending you this easy flush device and hope you find it useful for a video. Thanks, it's Rick. There we go, Rick Larrabee. Thanks, Rick. what is a easy flush? I have no idea what an easy flush. Is it some super duper uh, toilet flushing mechanism? I have no idea. Thank you very much, Rick. And there's Rick's business card. He's actually Richard. Or Dick. Do you call you Dick? I don't know. Chief Engineer at Building Technology Engineers and MCOR Company. It's an easy flush. It is a sensor. Sensor. I was right. It's a sensor retrofit kit for automatic flushing of urinals and water closets. ADA compliant for. It's got the little. Uh, little wheelchair symbol down in there so I guess it's uh I don't know what ADA is but it's compliant I like compliant stuff <laughs> all right let's take this out and have a look at it that's bizarre I've never gotten anything to do with toilets before ah look at yeah it's one of those sensor heads you see when you step away from it so this actually could be interesting tear down to actually see What's inside one of these? Reduces maintenance. <laughs> Eliminates odors from unflushed fixtures. Retrofits to Zoom. Uh, one model for both urinals and water closets. Awesome. There you go. It's one of those ones where it detects how close you are to the urinal. And uh, as soon as you're finished, I guess it's got to have a timer on it to uh, time how long you've been standing in front of it. You know, so it doesn't get people like walking past or walking in there for a couple of seconds and deciding, nah, I'm not going to use this dunny, I'm going to use the one next door because this one's atrocious. So uh, it's got to detect that you've been there for, you know, you've stood there for 10 or 20 seconds and then uh, you've stepped away from it. So it's got a proximity, uh, proximity detector. Oh, I can already see, you probably can't catch that on camera, but I can certain, hello, I can see myself. I'm funny looking, but then again, that's me. Let's crack this thing open and check it out. I don't think I'm going to wait for a teardown Tuesday for this one. I think we'll crack this open right now. Woohoo, check it out. You can see my lens. Look at that. That's the lens of my Canon HF G10 camera. And uh, they've got one of these security um, hex screws on it. Really quite annoying. The uh, bottom of it had a standard uh, Phillips. I've taken that out, but it doesn't seem to uh, come apart. So let's, I uh, probably got one of those bits somewhere. Let's have a look. Now, unfortunately, the only thing that got us into is the battery compartment. There's, uh, it looks like there's you know, four um, C size batteries in this thing. And I don't have any C size batteries in the lab, I don't think. Bummer. Anyway, uh, oh, oh, no, there we go. Oh, that was actually easy. Piece of cake. Ta-da! There it is! Look at that! We've got, hey, we've got a motor. We've got some cogs which just activates the plunger there. You can see that spin around. And, yeah, it doesn't go in that direction. It only goes one direction and then plunger comes out. Bingo! And I assume that goes to some sort of pipe work or something to do with the toilet. I have no idea about the physical, what's that? That looks like it's a tool, and it's just built in there for, oh, it's a little, it's a little screwdriver. Check it out. Little flathead screwdriver, so it's designed to, obviously, ah, there we go. It's the adjustment tool for that pot up there. There you go. To adjust the sensor range. Hey, this is rather neat. There we go. Adjust the sensor range up and down. Audio on or off. 
<laughs> I didn't know these things beeped. Um, and sounds as a to, uh, I guess, activate it if it, it's a manual flush. There it tells you. This model flushes after each use. Right, range test button. There we go. So we can adjust the range on this thing. So let's take these screws off. And we've got a couple of LEDs there. We've got a little, uh, uh, looks like a red diffused filter on the front. And we've got a green and yellow LED. Let's take that off and see what's on the board. Just a little micro, nothing more. And check it out, it's very old school. It's got a big uh, 22 pin, uh, 0.3 inch dip package, which is a TC3024. And uh, my internet in the office isn't working at the moment, so I can't check that. I have no idea what that is off uh, the top of my head. And there's another 8 pin chip we'll check out up here. And there's a couple of status LEDs and obviously an infrared uh, transmitter or transmitter and infrared receiver there. So it uh, measures the distance based on that uh, time period. There's a couple of in internal uh, factory set trim pots there and it's all uh, through hole stuff. Discrete transistors, TO92 packages. There's a nice O-ring seal around the outside as you'd expect in this uh, sort of environment and not much all so and not much else at all So that's got to be some form of uh, microcontroller and the other chip is a Hitachi HA17358 I'm going to assume that is uh, Hitachi's variant of the LM358 op amp now I want to power this thing up, but I don't have any C cell batteries Well, there's nothing you can't fix with a pair of side cutters So we'll just hack into this thing and we'll uh, Hook that up to our bench supply. Bob's your uncle. Now, unfortunately, I haven't actually been able to get this thing to do the business, i.e., <laughs> if you pardon the pun, uh, detect the, um, you know, anything in range and activate the motor there. There's a manual uh, flush override. There it goes. Oh, it's, you have to wait a time period before it can do again, but that's manual fl uh, flush override. There's another... Uh, tactile switch over here which seems to reset the thing or something like that um, and really yeah I can't get it I've followed the instructions to sort of set the uh, distance trim pot here and the mode switch and I just can't seem to get it to actually detect anything there like you're supposed to hold it there for five seconds so it discriminates against people just walking past but haven't been able to get the damn thing working but we can take a look at some of the signals. So let's do that. Now, what we've got here is the two infrared uh, LEDs here, these clear ones, and they're driven by these two dropper resistors here. So I'm just tapping off a point there. That'll go to channel two on the uh, scope. That'll be the green channel you'll see on the uh, scope. So that's the transmitter. And then we've got the infrared uh, receiver um, LED over here and then we've got the infrared receiver here the dark colored one and I've just tapped off the signal from that so we can measure that and of course it comes with this little uh, IR filter so it doesn't seem to actually make any difference whether or not we have this on or off but for the purposes of today's experiment I'll just leave it on there all right let's take a look at the waveforms the top one here is the uh, transmitter so there's a very small narrow pulse in there we'll zoom in and take a look at that and here's the receiver down here now let's actually we'll, we'll single shot capture that actually so let's uh, let's go in there and we can see that the time period is 200 milliseconds so we'll single shot capture that bang we're in there 200 400 600 800 odd milliseconds every 800 milliseconds so let's say roughly once a second this thing outputs a pulse there and this is the receiver so what we're going to do now is just try different distances I will cup my hand over this thing this is right there's nothing in the way at the moment the uh, roof is about you know a meter and a half above this thing or something or you know almost about that and we're getting no return pulse on the receiver here but let me cup my hand over it maybe an inch away and bingo we get a return pulse like that and the horizontal the horizontal stuff all remains the same the width of this um, window where it detects that remains the same but we get that little blip in there that obviously it's uh it's probably you know ac coupling that and it's able to detect that level 
And if I put my hand right over it so my hand is touching, like my hand is actually, you know, it's right over there, it's cupping the whole thing, then that seems to be the maximum signal level that comes out of it. So what's probably happening there is they're just AC coupling the output from that receiver LED, they're just amplifying that. And then the uh, adjustment pot, which sets the range here, just sets the uh, threshold limit of that detection range. So if you put your hand right over it, it like that, that I was doing, it, uh, you know, it, it couples the maximum amount of infrared between the transmitter and the receiver in there. And that's pretty much uh, exactly what you'd expect with uh, one of these distance sensors. You just uh, expect there to be a different level pulse out of this thing, depending on how high you are, well, how far you are away from this particular object. So pretty basic operation. Unfortunately, I'm not able to get the damn thing working. I'm able to do the manual override, but I, I don't know. I, there could be something wrong with this, or maybe it is a PEBCAC thing and I'm just not uh, setting it up right or something, but we can see those signals, which is rather interesting. But that microcontroller does other intelligent stuff, like it has a power on mode, so when you first turn it on, um, it'll continuously flash the yellow uh, LED, apparently, even though I haven't got it working, for the first 10 minutes during operation, so that you can just manually test the thing after you install it, and then after that uh, first 10 minute window, it switches to normal operation, where the yellow light only flashes three times when you move away. And of course, there's probably some finer detail going on there as well in terms of discrimination of uh, ambient light and re various reflective uh, surfaces of various people, whether you're using, you know, a black shirt or whether you walked in with a, you know, a reflective a safety vest or something like that. So yeah, these, there might be a bit more devil in the detail there. And next up we have Josip Medved. Thanks, Josip. Uh, he's from Redmond in Washington. Haven't been to Redmond, Washington. Um, home of Microsoft, isn't it? Or was? Or something like that? Um, uh, Smedved.com. Thank you very much. And remember, if you want to send stuff in, send it to that crazy Aussie bloke. PO Box 7949, Borkham Hills, New South Wales, 2153, Australia. You know it's not Austria. A lot of people complain about that. Jeez, I keep saying it. Get over it. Ah, unbelievable. It's a joke. Jeez. So let's uh, have a look. It's pretty, pretty hefty, actually. What does it say? Broken. Oh, here we go. Broken GPS. GPS cable. Broken GPS. No wonder it's heavy and a broken cable. So, thanks, Jossip. There's a. Oh, it's an Etrex Legend. There we go. Etrex Legend. I've um, done a video on the original uh, Etrex Yeller, um, the yellow version. That's uh, there you go. I've never had a genuine Etrex cable actually. Um, I sort of hacked one up myself a uh, long time ago. As you already uh, see, this is well-worn garment Etrex Legend. I had it for quite a while, and I didn't spare it of any challenge. Surprisingly, it did survive and should be in working order. That is unless the United States Postal Service and OzPost did their bid in. You may use it and abuse it in any manner you please. Thank you very much, Josip. So it's actually a usable Etrex Legend. Brilliant. That's actually better than the um, Etrex Yeller I've got. Ah, oh, it's got the joystick. Love it. Um, yeah, I, I don't, it's almost a shame to, uh, uh, there we go. It's um, still got the, he's got batteries in it. So it probably is a go. Let's uh, turn it on. This, hey, look at this. This unit belongs to EV blog. Press return. Oh, brilliant. Well done. Oh, I don't think I could uh, destroy a perfectly good Etrex legend. No way. I, I think this is a keeper. It's an absolute keeper. I think they're a real dog to... Uh, take apart, actually, warning. Yeah, the old firmware didn't have this, well, at least for the E-Trex Yeller, it didn't have this ridiculous warning and uh, stuff like that. You know the GPS is for your car. Yeah, you've got to press an extra button saying, saying you accept liability and all that sort of crap. And it's not going to find satellites in here, of course, but, uh, oh, no, I couldn't possibly uh, destroy in any way an E-Trex legend. I love the... Uh, 
see-through. I didn't know it came in this uh, see-through transparent uh, or translucent uh, case like that. You can see some wiring in there. I can see a header connector in there. And uh, you can see the GPS module in there with its uh, patch antenna. There you go. So, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to take it apart, but I've heard they're a real dog because, um, well, you can take it apart, of course, but you'd never get it back together because all this uh, rubber surround is all glued on. You can see, actually, some of the, uh, probably some of the glue oozing out there. I don't know why it's been subjected to uh, heavy use. My E-Trex Yellers had all sorts of things, horrible things done to it. Um, and yeah, this rubber surround, you've got to totally unpeel it off to separate it. It might even be heat sealed, the case, or something like that, because there's, as far as I'm aware, there's, because I've never taken my E-Trex Yeller apart, but there's no uh, screws in this thing at all. So, you know, you can see some of the circuitry through the translucent case there, but Anyway, thank you very much, Jossip. That is um, brilliant. Maybe I'll take apart my E-Trex Yeller now and I'll upgrade to the E-Trex Legend. I can certainly use this for uh, canyoning and uh, geocaching and maybe in some uh, future videos. Thanks, Jossip. It's brilliant. And the good thing about the E-Trex Legend over my E-Trex Yeller is that this one has downloadable uh, topo maps. I think it even has Australian maps available. So I might see if I can... Uh, download an Australian topo map for this and give it a go and uh, you can tell it's had a hard life. The uh, lanyard uh, strap here is broken off. There's supposed to be a bar in there for uh, putting your lanyard strap through and that's uh, obviously uh, broken off in some manner and uh, if you haven't seen the, uh, hey look at that, yeah, this is really, it certainly has had a hard life. He wasn't, uh, wasn't kidding but uh, Certainly, this is still a very capable GPS, and it's got this um, uh, custom uh, Garmin cable. And at the time when the uh, E-Trex series was probably the most popular uh, GPS in the world, it's probably sold in like in terms of an outdoor unit. Like this is before you could buy car GPSs when you know you basically had these uh, handheld. Uh, unit. The E-Trex uh, series was, I believe, like the largest selling GPS in the world. It had this custom connector and um, somebody, I'm not sure who it was, but this was before, you know, open source hardware came about. They basically, um, you know, and crowdsource funding and all that sort of stuff. Somebody actually uh, reverse engineered this connector and made a duplicate of it um, and sold it. And he sold like, you know, tens of thousands or a hundred thousand of them or something. So he got a huge, I can't remember the guy's name or what the project name was I'd have to actually uh, Google that to find out, but he made this uh, custom connector, and he basically um, gave it away almost. It was like uh, you know a, a free thing. You just did it for the kudos or something like that. Hang on, let me Google it. I've got to Google it. It it is a, a real good example of. Uh, you know, a, sort of like a, a hardware thing before all this crowdsource funding and open source hardware came along. And I just Googled that, and of course it's uh, the famous uh, PFRANK connector, uh, Larry from uh, PFRANK.com. I'll put the link in below. And he's manufactured over 800,000 of these, um, uh, you know, worker-like um, compatible E-Trex connectors in the last 14 years. And he's... Um, he didn't actually sell these. What he did is he'd send you two of these for free. He'd, you know, no questions asked. He'd send it to you for free, and he just asked that you, you know, basically donate if you want. If you found that the service was good, you would you would pay him something for it, and he would leave it up to you. So it was sort of like the, uh, you know, the old um, shareware principle or something like that in terms of uh, hardware. So this was before open source hardware came along. This is not a P Frank, um, this is not a P Frank uh, one, by the way. This looks like a genuine Garmin uh, E-Trex one, but there you go. Um, Frank from uh, P pfrank.com pioneered uh, giving away hardware like that. It's free. Only pay what you think it's worth. And the next one comes from Maxim EC, is it? Or a C Maxim? I've been uh, 
uh, taken to task about getting, um, you know, last name first, uh, first initial second uh, kind of thing wrong before. So uh, anyway, from Canada, hi to all my Canadian viewers. I love Canada, one of my favorite countries in the world. And uh, look at some lovely stamps there, check it out. Beautiful little uh, flying insect thing. And there we go, we've got the Queenie, good old Queenie, because uh, Canada is part of the Commonwealth. So let's open this sucker up and uh, see what we've got. Very thin, very flat, and uh, ah, these are a bit of a, these are a bit of a pain to, let's just go, yeah, like that. There we go, that's easier. What do we got? Oh, some postcards. I think we've got some postcards, folks. I'm sending you these postcards because you are helping hobbyists like me. Thank you very much. Maxim Clermont, excellent. Oh, is that his uh, forum username? Expert Max one if he's on at Montreal. There we go, postcards. That will go into my postcard collection. I'm gonna have to, uh, put these up on the wall maybe in, uh, you know, so they're behind me in the main video or something. But please, people, uh, send me uh, postcards because I haven't been to these places. Like Montreal, haven't been to Montreal. Looks beautiful, look at that. Cathedral there and uh, some statue of some important dude in Montreal. Beautiful. And here's some of the other imagery from Montreal. Home of the world's best uh, comedy festival. By the way, that's a hell of a lot of snow. The poor bastard who owns that red car under there. Woohoo! Sucked in. And uh, it looks lovely. I'd love to go to Montreal, especially to the comedy uh, festival. More cars covered in snow. That seems to be the order of the day in Montreal in wintertime. <laughs> Hope it doesn't get that bad in uh, summertime, that's for sure. So there you go. Thank you very much, Maxime. That's brilliant. And what do we have here? We have an air sensor and interface. Whoa, 40 euros, is it? There you go. And uh, we have some Slovenia. I have hide all my Slovenian, if that's the correct uh, term. Viewers, I don't think I've had something from Slovenia before. That's a beautiful looking flower there and uh, something to do with fire. I'm not sure what that is. Go figure. There you go, is that like a fire extinguisher or something? Not quite sure what's, uh, what's going on there. Anyway, I'm sure someone will correct, correct me on that. And this is from Matens Bosmak, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm horrible at pronunciations. Sorry people, if I get it wrong, <laughs> I do apologize. From Slovenia, let's crack this sucker open and see what we have here. <clears throat> Sorry if my voice is all froggy. I can't do much about it. Jeez, you know, people have complained about that. Oh, clear your throat, etc., etc. Jeez, you know, give me a break. And here you go. I've got my own sort of username and password for their system here for a Cosm feed. Um, so let's have a look at what this is all about. Hi Dave, I noticed that you're enjoying your new office space and what I figured I would do is send you one of our devices with an SHT21 sensor. Ah, I've used that range of our sensors before. If memory serves me correctly, they're an I squared C. Oh yeah, yep, there we go, I squared C interface sensor, I think. Um, it is a high resolution relative humidity sensor and as such measures both humidity and temperature of the air. Awesome, thank you very much. Device that the sensor is attached to, the Pokey, is a highly versatile I.O. interface, 55 configurable digital inputs and outputs, wow, seven analog inputs, six PWM outputs, wow, 24 digital counters, oh, encoder pairs, it's got everything. Uh, device you received is configured to read the SHT21 sensor and output the values to both the web interface, ooh, accessible in your local network, and COSM web service available worldwide. Oh, excellent, a web interface sensor. I'm gonna have to try this, so maybe um, you, hopefully I can link to it uh, down below if it works, um, and you can get a real-time update of what the humidity and temperature is in my lab. That'd be cool, no pun intended. Uh, if you need to reconfigure the device, use the Pokies. Already, he's already created an account for me. Excellent, I'm gonna go, it needs uh, 300 milliamps at five volts. Um, I assume the summer is coming. Oh yeah, it's coming. It's, uh, what is it now? 
It's not quite uh, uh, November yet, but uh, summer's coming in December. Uh, helping tool to establish proper climate in your working environment. Thank you very much, Matev or Matez, um, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And here it is. Check this out. This looks pretty awesome. And, oh, look at all those head, look at all those screw terminals. Oh, I'm liking, uh, it barely fits in the bag. Oh, I'm liking this. I'm liking this. Look at all those lovely screw terminals. The first thing I notice is that the alignment is uh, slightly off there. One is closer, I presume deliberately closer to the edge of the board. That's rather uh, unusual. I'm not sure why that's the case. This one down the bottom looks to be relatively aligned up, but that is, uh, this thing is absolutely chock-a-block. Uh, interface here with a micro, which we'll have a look at, and a battery backup for uh, presumably for uh, date and time there and uh, it's another external interface but this sucker um, powered there's the external 5 volt interface there voltage regulator clearly and this looks really neat pokies I like it check them out at poscope.com this I think could be fun and there's the main device on this thing it's an NXP LPC uh, series ARM processor, the 1764FBD100. And then we've got another national semiconductor device there. That's presumably the uh, Ethernet interface chip because there's the Ethernet interface there. So there you go. There's not much else on there. There's, a, there's an oscillator. Well, there's actually two oscillators down there by the looks of it. There's a 50... Is that 50 mega? Yeah, there's a 50 megahertz and another one down there. Is that a uh, 32 kilohertz uh, crystal perhaps for the real time clock? Oh, I like this. This is really neat. I just like the form factor and stuff. I'm going to plug this in. And here's the tiny little uh, sensor board, obviously uh, hand assembled. And there's the SHT21 temperature and humidity sensor. These are really neat uh, devices. I was using these, oh geez, to, oh, I'm not going to say 10 years ago, but probably not far off. Um, and they're really neat uh, devices, I believe, I2C uh, interface. And we've got a, uh, a uh, 117 uh, low dropout uh, voltage regulator there and the SHT21 sensor and of course that just plugs in to the expansion bus on that board and that allows us to measure temperature and humidity but uh, this board is capable of an awful lot more than that this is just one of its cap web enabled capabilities so the idea is you hook up a whole bunch of sensors to this web interface board and well only one way to find out if it's any good plug it in and see if it works straight off the bat so apparently all i've got to do is hook it up to ethernet uh, network here which i've done and uh, plug in the sensor board temperature humidity sensor board apparently the account has already been uh, set up for me so let's go to the website and see if we can access it just via the web page it should just work oh and i've hooked up five volts externally here as well and you can see that the status letters blink in there so presumably that's a good thing and it's sending data i guess each time it flashes perhaps something like that so Let's go to the web. And sure enough, look at this. It works instantly out of the box. I've gone to the uh, web page here, cosm.com feeds 78280. It's not very descriptive, but presumably that's the individual serial number for my device. And bingo, it's already been uh, labeled and set up, for, uh, set up for me, but I'm sure that's uh, relatively easy to set up and change. But bang, it seems to be working it's currently 25.61 degrees or so it claims at uh, 39.57 oh super duper accurate there <laughs> lots of resolution on the uh on both the temperature and the humidity there so basically almost 40 percent humidity i don't know that'd be about right i don't have the aircon on at the moment which is why it is uh 25.61 degrees so let me go switch uh the aircon on and see if it makes a difference but uh Anyway, here's the, uh, it gives you a map as well, latitude and longitude. And no, this is not uh, the exact location of the EEV log office. It's probably uh, the near enough to the, like the exchange, 
you know, that my internet connection is at or uh, something like that. But as it is certainly within the vicinity of Borkham Hills, which is where I reside in Sydney there. So it knows, knows my general location. You can see that I'm in northwest uh, part, of the, part of Sydney there. There's the entire Sydney area. If uh, people haven't seen it before, it's pretty darn huge. There's the Blue Mountains up where I go canyon in, and that's Sydney, and that's Australia, not Austria. And there's the rest of the world. Aren't we uh, pretty well isolated? But let's see how that uh, compares with uh, the my thermometer on my fluke meter, for example. And it was saying 25.6 degrees on the web. Uh, interface there, but it's actually, according to my fluke, it's 25.3. This is like plus minus 1% uh, accurate. So, you know, you include the accuracy of this one, the accuracy of this one. They're not exactly uh, spot on, but uh, let me turn the aircon on and uh, see if we can watch this thing ramp down in temperature. And I've turned the aircon on and you can see it dipping down like that. It's currently 23.4 degrees and that's actually what uh, exactly what my pretty much exactly uh, what my fluke uh, temperature probe is now uh, saying but uh, it looks like this only um, uh, sort of like sample. I'm not sure how quickly it samples but doesn't like every minute or every couple of minutes. I'm sure I can uh, set this up somehow so show trigger events. I don't know. There's lots of graph builder there's all sorts of stuff, duration, a day, scale to fit, there's all sorts of stuff you can do. It doesn't look like we can actually um, set the time period here because this is, I think this is just the public feed. So this is the one, uh, the user, you can access, you can just go to this uh, page and as long as I've got the power turned on and I've got it connected, you'll be able to see my current lab temperature and my lab graph in uh, real time, which is uh, really quite neat. I like this. And if we go into the, uh, I've logged into my account, uh, Cosm. I don't think um, this device is actually affiliated with Cosm in any way. It just happens to use this Cosm Internet of Things stuff. You know, it's a, here it is, about the Internet of Things. Cosm makes the world more connected. Internet of Things is happening. Blah, 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 blah. Insert uh, Internet of Things wank word. And, uh, but apparently this, uh, this uh, um, device has been designed to interface with the uh, COSM website. And here you go. I've uh, set this up and we can just add data streams here. It's already been, um, he's already set up uh, a couple of the relative humidity and the temperature for me. But of course, this thing is capable of measuring and uh, acquiring a lot more data than that. So you can set up any sort of data stream. I'm not sure you can give it an ID. Yeah, I haven't looked into the details, but you can add all this stuff and it looks like um, you can push and pull data as well so you can go no, so you can select no I will push data to Cosm from my device will push data to the website or you can set it up so Cosm uh, polls the device and pulls the data in there from that and you can have a um, you can set up uh, the location of where your device is and all sorts of tags and all your public and private info it's really quite nice. And here's the uh, Polabs device. And as I said, I don't think they're affiliated with uh, COSM in any way. They're just uh, using this service, but I'm willing to be corrected on that. And here it is, um, 60 euros for the one I've got. This is the uh, Ethernet interface one. They also have a USB uh, interface one as well, the Pokey's 56U, but the one I've got is a 56E. I kind of like the uh, the Ethernet one because it just then just connects directly to your Ethernet internet network, uh, your router, which I uh, pretty much leave on all the time here, and it can just send data, no need for a PC or anything like that. But, um, you know, some people might find use for the USB one. They've also got some, uh, looks like they've got uh, a USB scope and spectrum analyzer, and some other stuff here as well, some uh, basic type stuff, basic 2. No, it's not actually basic as in the programming language, I don't think. Could be wrong. Anyway, they've got a whole bunch of stuff here. Check them out, postscope.com. And if we check out COSM here, this is uh, like my console, and I can add devices and feed. So if I've got more than one device, hey, Twitter status. There you go, Twitter stats. Create a test feed by adding your... 
Twitter stats, I guess. Can we announce that the relative humidity on my Twitter account? I might give that a try. Um, and it supports Arduino. There you go. Uh, using the uh, Ethernet uh, shield. Something else. So I guess they've got a uh, driver. I'm not sure how they've set this thing up. Um, I guess I'd have to read the documentation. I won't go into it. This is not going to be a review or anything like that. Um, a full-on review. It's just a thing. It worked out of the box. Um, it was already set up for me, sure, but uh, I don't think it would be uh, that hard at all. Well, this Pokey's 56 device sounds really powerful. Check out the feature set here. Uh, it's got 55 digital inputs, uh, 50 device software controlled digital outputs with pull-up resistors, 7 analog inputs, 12-bit resolution, adjustable low-pass filtering, 26 encoder pairs, 3 axes, 25 kilohertz pulse engine, digital counters, a 16x8 matrix keyboard interface, 2 8x8 matrix LED display support, 6 high-speed fully configurable PWM outputs, 25 meg PWM timer, it's got a standard uh, Hitachi LCD support, 4x20 characters, oh man, it's just crazy, Modbus support, all sorts of things, uh, support for up to 10 sensors on the I2C bus, one wire bus, analog sensors, it's got the web interface stuff, oh man, it's all happening, and you can also download their complete protocol specification that seems to have bloody well everything, man, it's pretty huge, so all the data you need to configure and uh, talk to this thing looks like it's all there as you'd expect and I'm not sure what the discrepancy was before but uh, the I've let it uh, settle here and the web is showing 22.81 degrees Celsius and my fluke here is showing 22 point well was showing 22.8 22.9 so it's pretty much bang on so thank you very much for that Matez that's uh Brilliant. I really like this little uh, Pokies 56E device and I can probably hook up a whole bunch of other stuff. Look at this. It's just begging to be hooked up. All sorts of stuff I can uh, uh, add to the lab. I can add to this thing and people can monitor stuff. I'm not sure why you'd want to, but you can see things happening in my lab. I can add all sorts of stuff to this. It looks massively versatile, you know, ADCs and PWMs and all sorts of stuff and uh, presumably I'd be able to control it from the web interface as well actually control outputs uh, from this as well I'm definitely gonna have to read more into it have not read the manual for this yet but seems incredibly powerful thanks Matez and by the way for those following along on my uh, Twitter account you'll know that I had a uh, an aircon failure here in the lab a few days ago uh, and it cost me um, a little bit of money to get it fixed and this was the culprit this Italian iCar, iCar brand uh, this is a run capacitor for the compressor used in the aircon up in the roof here look at this this just spewed its guts out oh, look at that absolutely brilliant it just blew the ass out of itself and uh, yeah, that cost me a couple hundred bucks to fix. Bugger. So in the end, it was a pretty uh, easy fix because this uh, run capacitor just uh, stopped the compressor from working. Very easy fix, but it uh, took the aircon guy an hour to uh, find it. This uh, run capacitor was uh, tucked away in a very difficult to access uh, location, so they had to rule out everything else first. And it, uh, yeah, cost a little bit to get it fixed, but that's all it was. Dodgy cap. So there you have it. There's the uh, mailbag. I know a lot of uh, people have been uh, writing in, yeah, letters, and uh, asking me, you know, when's the next mailbag? They can't seem to get enough of it. So there you go. I hope you uh, thought that mailbag was enjoyable. And if you want to send me some uh, unusual stuff and get on the blog here, then uh, you know the address to send it to. And if you like Mailbag Monday, please give it a big thumbs up. Catch you next time.